good evening. It's a privilege to be here. I know that we're joined together, and thank you to all of the organizers who brought us together. Special thanks for giving Medea and Anne and I a chance to connect. But I know that what connects us in the Descartes Corps is that we want to claim, as is a civil right, our right not to kill. To claim our right not to kill. I happened to be in upstate New York some months back in Boone Community County College, a community college, and a young man began to speak after we had talked about the amount of, of, of heroin that's being exported from Afghanistan. 93% uh, of the world's heroin is uh, coming from Afghanistan, and I had just returned from Afghanistan, as I have just again returned from Afghanistan recently. And this young man said, I went to high school with some of the most beautiful young girls in the world. And the next thing we knew, he was crying. He said, now they look like ravaged old witches. He said, they're all addicted to heroin. Now, I can't make a lot of factual connections at this point, but I can tell you that there has certainly been a lowering of the price of heroin here in the United States that is likely connected to the glut of heroin on the market because so many peasant farmers in Afghanistan are growing poppy. Probably the heroin coming in here is coming from Mexico. But I want us to think about this a little bit further because Medina has talked to us about the drone surveillance. It's almost 24-7 over Afghanistan. Afghanistan is the epicenter for drone attacks. Shouldn't some of those drone planes possibly notice that there's a constant trafficking of poppy and heroin going along roadways and outside of Afghanistan? And then we come to learn from even the New York Review of Books that, in fact, the roadways along which the trucks are bringing truck-delivered supplies to United States bases, roadways that first begin in Pakistan and then cross into Afghanistan, are roadways that are controlled by the Pakistani Taliban and the Afghan Taliban. And it's not exactly easy pass, but the United States military pays a toll tax to the Pakistani Taliban, to the Afghan Taliban, for every single truck that delivers supplies. And the truck lines go on constantly. And so it is actual fact that the United States military has been subsidizing the Taliban over these long years of United States military presence in Afghanistan. Subsidizing the Pakistani and the Afghan Taliban. And yet US people are expected to believe that we're over there protecting women and children from the Taliban. And this is the kind of lying, this is the kind of misinformation that makes things so dangerous for people in other lands and for people here and for my young friend in Boone County who wept over the conditions of the women that he'd gone to high school with. And so I'm in Colorado and reading the Colorado Gazette, the military life section of their paper, and I read that young Soldiers from Fort Carson, Colorado, who are in Kandahar in Afghanistan, are corresponding with sixth grade girls in Baltimore, Maryland. And in some ways, I think, well, gosh, you know, I do that too by Skype with the kids over there in Afghanistan. But the soldiers are telling the sixth grade girls, we've done a lot of good for women in Afghanistan. Now the girls can go to school. Well, my young friends in Afghanistan don't speak with pleasure and pride over all the good that's been done for them. 6% of girls in Afghanistan ever finish a year of schooling. 18% of the boys. 27% of families have access to pure water. When I've been over there, we get electricity every other day if we're lucky. It's very, very cold all throughout the winter. One million children are now suffering from secure, I'm sorry, severe acute malnourishment. And that story came out in the New York Times while I was lost in Afghanistan. And I couldn't look at the pictures. I couldn't look at the video. I'd seen too much in Iraq. When we were at the bedsides of children in Iraq who were suffering and wasting away because of US imposed economic sanctions. My friend Martin Thomas, he's a nurse from the UK. He sized up what was happening in a pediatrics ward, and he looked at me and he said, I think I understand. It's a death row for infants, isn't it? A death row for infants. 
This happened to a half million children in Iraq. And now we find out that one million children in Afghanistan are suffering from severe acute malnourishment if they survive. They'll surely be experiencing stunted growth, brain damage, and chronic illnesses throughout the rest of their lives. Now there's almost a, something like good news. Do you know what it would cost to get the amount of iodized salt into the diet of a starving child so that the iodine deficiency disorder could be countered. Five cents per child per year. And do you know what we're now spending to keep one United States soldier in Afghanistan for one year? $2.1 million. How shall we understand maybe justice and the scales? $2.1 million to keep one U.S. soldier in Afghanistan for one year, and it would cost five cents to offset the possibility of an Afghan child experiencing brain damage caused by iodine deficiency disorder. $6.4 million is what it would cost to bring fortified foods to 15 million Afghan people. 6.4 million, that's three of our soldiers. And so what kinds of choices are being put before us? And even General McChrystal said in January of 2013 that the arrogance of our drone policy is actually lowering, jeopardizing security for people in the United States because other people in Afghanistan and other parts of the world where robotized, mechanized computers are assassinating people, where the U.S. military presence continually reinforces the idea that we think that our lives are worth so much vastly so much more than the lives of their children, their loved ones, they begin to feel anger, they begin to feel resentment. And we would too, as Anne and Medea have pointed out to us. And the drones will never ever give us the intelligence we really need. We need to know and to understand how our policies are affecting the neediest of people in other lands. And the drone surveillance simply won't give us that kind of information. There's a wonderful man, Charlie King, he's in his 70s, and he's put forth a song about drones. And I figure if Charlie can do this in his 70s, maybe I can pull it off in my 60s. And it's a song that touches me. I'd like to share this song with you. Um, a number of us from Voices will be walking from Chicago to Battle Creek, Michigan, uh, January, sorry, sorry, June 3rd to 14th. And you're so welcome to join us. And that's yet another Air National Guard base that's going to be turned into a base for operating surveillance and weaponized drones. And this is happening all across the country. And it's something I think we can put our minds around and begin to explore and understand better. But here's another approach, um, a, a song based on the Stephen Sondheim song, which people are closer to me in age might remember. Isn't it strange? Isn't it queer? One of us safe on the ground, one in midair. Where are the drones? Never leave home, never ask why. One rolls a joystick around, one gets to fly. Which is the drone? Hundreds are winded, thousands are made, digitized dolls on a screen, no faces, no names. Finish my four o'clock shift, and I find I'm alone, far from the fray, address unknown. Don't give your name, feel no regret. Ask not for whom the bell tolls, fire and forget. Only a drone, a defensible drone. No problem yet. Isn't it strange? Isn't it queer? Terror remotely controlled a pilot's career. Where are the drones? Why are there drones? Is anyone there? 
Is anyone there? Jane Ann Phillips, writing about the war in Korea in a novel that she situated during that war, wrote about a war-weary soldier. He was so tired, he missed his sweetheart, he wanted to come home. And he said, the planes always come, like planets on rotation, a time bloodletting with different excuses. The planes always come, like planets on rotation, a timed bloodletting with different excuses. But we know together as we claim our right not to kill, there are no excuses, none, for killing children, for starving children, for misinforming a U.S. public to think that there could ever be such a thing as a humanitarian war. And so, yes, let us catch courage from one another. Let us stand together, shoulder to shoulder, shoulder to shoulder with Medea, her dislocated shoulder, finding the passion and the compassion and the certainty that we will claim our right not to.